Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Perpetual Chess. We have a great interview coming your way with National Master and Chess Educator of the Year, Gerald Times. But I just wanted to let you guys know that, uh, of course, these interviews are always unscripted, um, and that's what makes them enjoyable for me and insightful. But we have a couple clarifications coming at the end of the interview. So after you hear us say goodbye in this interview, uh, don't stop listening yet. Just uh, stay tuned, and Gerald will be rejoining us to clarify a few things. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined this year by the 2021 Chess Educator of the Year. Of course, we've been privileged to interview other Chess Educator of the Year. That is an award given by the University of Texas at Dallas. We've interviewed uh, Elizabeth Spiegel and uh, some other winners of the award in the past. Um, And this gentleman is a USCF master with a peak FIDE rating of over 2,400. He is a chess commentator, a teacher, of course, two-time Harlem chess champion. He's been a national coach in South Africa as well, uh, even though he is, of course, a New York City native. He has been the chess director of the Harlem's Children's Zone, and now he's launching his own organization called Chess Across Borders. So without further ado, let's welcome Gerald Times to the show. Gerald, how are you? Well, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh very excited about uh, being here and I've uh, listened to your podcast a few times and you've had some amazing guests so privileged uh, to be a part of the uh, of the four here. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, happy to have you. And we might as well just cop to it for listeners, Gerald. This is our second recording of the interview, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna try to uh, keep it organic for listeners. But uh, but we did have um, some audio issues with our first one, so Gerald is being gracious and recording it again. Um, so I appreciate that, Gerald, but let, let's dive right into your chess. Um, so Gerald, I'd kind of like to begin with your own chess career. Like a lot of people who end up making a living in chess, obviously, you've transitioned to uh, other areas of emphasis, in your case, teaching and the organization you launched. But you became quite strong at a time when the online tools uh, were not what they are now. In fact, the online tools didn't exist at the beginning. Um, so could you walk us through your own chess improvement journey and how you uh, got found your way into the chess world, Gerald? So I started chess at the age of 11. Uh, at the time, there weren't many strong players around. Uh, I played a few tournaments. Uh, I took the path of many chess players before these digital tools, before the internet, analyzing engines and databases that makes uh, the plays you know, quite strong now. Um, but I studied, you know, I mean, I studied uh, the classic books. Uh, Think Like a Grandmaster was a tremendous uh, book. I mean, obviously the Bible that everyone else reads, uh, my, my System by Nimzovich. Uh, my early influence was uh, Aliyekin, uh, mostly due to the fact that he was a tremendous calculator. Uh, he, he was incredible in terms of his planning, um, and he showed a flair for uh, tactical play. So that was my, my, my early influence. Uh, later on, I began to appreciate uh, Smivlov, Capablanca, but initially, I, I followed the attacking players. And that's usually what most people do. You, you find a player that's a, that has a very similar style as you. Or, uh, or has a certain likeness or affinity in certain positions that you have, and then you and then you try to see how they execute the position a little bit better than you would. Excellent, yeah. So well steeped in the classics, as I might expect from from a player in his fifties. And I actually, Gerald, did a <laughs> podcast about uh, think like a grandmaster, and I've got one in the works. Um, about my system. Now, Think Like a Grandmaster, of course, it's come up as a classic by uh, Grandmaster Alexander Kotov, as you mentioned um, a a few times on this podcast. Now, Alexander mentions this concept of candidate moves, where you basically choose a few finalists for a move and then calculate from there. And some other guests I've interviewed have sort of pushed back against that notion. Um, Some have suggested that that's not really how people think, and that's not how they should think. Now, what was your experience? Did you incorporate that as a fan of that book well, Do you, when yeah. you're playing? I mean, th- this is alongside with his whole concept of the tree of analysis. 
uh, that there is one single variation that, uh, that, you, that the main line, but we have to account for the other moves that, that the opponent uh, could play. Uh, first, we should mention that, that he's quite practical. I mean, even if we feel that the tree of analysis or candidate moves are, aren't, aren't played, he, he does tell you to look for forcing moves, the most forcing moves in the position. It's only when those, those moves are not forcing that we have to try to improve the position in some way. He also uh, gives a basic sense that you should know whether you're playing in a defensive position or whether you're playing in, in, in an attacking position. So even before we get, get into the candidate moves, there must be an assessment of the position. And Kolta felt that through first of the assessment, then, then we can come up with, with additional moves. I should mention that the Russians in general looked at analysis, not just as a technical thing, they looked at it as, as a creative venture, meaning ana through analysis, you should discover something new. Um, but whether or not, you know, we have not completely dismissed Kotov's idea of candidate moves. I'm sure we have a main line. And then everyone says, OK, if my opponent doesn't play the main line, it's just that every position, perhaps we cannot um, execute. Like you, you cannot use the candidate moves of the tree of analysis in every last chess position. Um, another key point uh, at the time, it might have been legal, but I thought I thought it was quite fascinating. Kolchov even wanted you to write the move down before you made before you made uh, made it. Now the USCF won't allow you to write the moves down anymore. Yeah. Before, uh, before before you ma you make it, but what he felt is that that was accessing both an unconscious minds, which means the move was not committed on the chessboard, but it was committed on the paper. And if there was some flaw in the move, it gave you some time, to, let's say, to think about it, to simmer a, a, a little bit, and ah, that might have been a mistake, and therefore you uh, you should uh, you should make these moves. So in that sense, that rule is outdated. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I found it incredibly uh, practical, particularly for a player at my strength. I wasn't yet a master uh, when I read. I think I was an expert at the time when I read uh, Think Like a Grandmaster. Yeah, those, those are some great insights. And yeah, I mean, everyone is going to have different opinions of these books. So I'm glad to get Gerald's. Um, and one thing I wonder, Gerald, of course, you're from New York City. So um, the chess culture runs deep there. There's obviously uh, the scholastic programs like you've been affiliated with in more recent years. There's the fabled Marshall Chess Club with the Manhattan Chess Club preceding it. And then there's sort of like uh, street chess as like Alexandra Botez and Levy Rosman recently have been capturing sort of the spirit of New York. So you mentioned these books that you read, which obviously are a big part of any chess education, um, or at least they, they were preceding the online age. But how did it all mix together with your playing? Like you're playing tournaments, you're playing um, Blitz for, for fun and for pride. Um, so how does it all intermix, like reading the books, playing Blitz and playing and analyzing tournaments? Right. So the early uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, New York had an incredibly rich street uh, chess culture. Uh, this is before the age of the Internet, when you can just play anyone on, on, online. People met in person, vis-a-vis, -vis, chat a chat, one on one. Um, and you got to see strong players. Um, the uh, street chess was improvisation, mostly speed, mostly speed, often for money. I would say six, seven times, six out of times if you played, uh, you played for money. Uh, this was your access to playing higher rated players. Um, if you didn't play, if you didn't meet them in a tournament, you can meet them on the street. Uh, and you could also observe sometimes a, a GM would come in, sometimes the IM would come in, FIDE masters uh, would come in in Washington Square Park. Uh, Washington Square Park in particular was the crossroads. Uh, as you know, Searching for Bobby Fischer, the uh, part of the film was actually uh, filmed in uh, in Washington Square Park. And there was just some some characters. It was a trash talking. Um, but I do I, I, one thing I do like a, about the street chess is that the, uh, you develop a certain improvis you, improvisational skills. Um, in fact, it's interesting because uh, Devryaski in one of his books talks about chess and jazz. And the analogy to, to jazz and chess is that chess there's a, comes to a point in the game when theory ends and you have to improvise. Um, and often on the street, you, you, it was dynamic. Um, and not only did you, you had to multitask because people are trash talking, people are betting, <laughs> people are talking on the side. So it was this multifaceted type of uh, approach uh, that you had. And I think it developed character. I think it developed mental toughness. Um, so uh, I do appreciate uh, my um, 
my my street experience but i uh, but ultimately to be a strong player you have to prepare you have to play ims and gms and fide masters uh street chess can take you but uh, so far uh but at the time it, it was it was the meeting ground and it was the learning ground uh, for many chess players well said yeah and i'm guessing that of course these days we have the algorithms like uh on chess.com you can do the game analysis and on lee chess you can also run the report and find out your critical mistakes and stuff like that. Now, we didn't have that luxury uh, <laughs> playing in Washington Square Park, which I, I, as a Philly native, didn't get to do super often. But when I did, I treasured it. Like, I would, if I had a tournament at the Marshall and I had some time, I'd go lose some money at Washington Square Park uh, when the opportunity arose. But I'm guessing you still were able to sort of tighten up your opening repertoire just through trial and error and sort of learning ideas if someone was, like, beating up on you in a certain line or something like that, Gerald? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, the at a certain level, we cannot um, uh, avoid this type of preparation. Moran Sheer, I uh, studied with him for about three months. Everyone thinks I studied with Moran longer than that. I was a 2200 uh, USEF rated player. Moran got me to 2400 FIDE. Uh, but the biggest thing that he gave me was the preparation. And it was practical preparation, meaning probably what you're going to see on the board. There's some preparation you, you do sometimes. Is this not practical? You never, no one's ever going to see it. But uh, these were the latest lines. Uh, they, they were in vogue, in other words. And that's, to, uh, that's why I think it may, that was one of his unique talents as a, as a trainer. Uh, so, yeah, opening preparation is definitely is, – it, it, it will take you to a certain point, but you do need to, to end game technique and middle game maneuvers, et cetera. But uh, definitely we, you cannot uh, pass 23, 2400 without knowing the first 15 moves. Yeah. Yeah. And Moran Sher, of course, uh, legendary trainer in New York Grandmaster who coached uh, Fabiano Caruana and Robert Hess, among others. And he passed away, unfortunately, in uh, recent years. So uh, rest in peace to Moran, but the, his his legacy lives on. Um, so I'd like to bring it forward a bit, Gerald. So I'm guessing these days you don't get to work on your game that much. Is that uh, a fair assessment? <laughs> that is a fair assessment. Uh, at this point, I'm looking to start a digital platform for chess. Um, and I've been directing. I mean, re really, I'm not, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's this term called the hero and then there's the hero guide. Uh, the hero guide is the one who, who, make, who teaches the hero to, uh, ultimately to save themselves. So helps the hero save, uh, save himself or save some, some, some greater cause. I, I think often as teachers and as directors, we are, we are, we are really the middlemen uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to a lot of young people wanting to uh, transform them lives, th their lives through chess. So I lived a life as a chess teacher. I lived a life as a chess player. And now I'm living the life as a chess director and ultimately as a, as a chess entrepreneur, as I would like to start a digital platform for the game. Excellent. Yeah. And actually, Gerald, I want to hear more about the digital platform and about your current sort of teaching approach, how it's evolved. But first, we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. And we are back. And as Gerald has alluded to, he is launching a, a new platform uh, called Chess Across Borders. So, Gerald, could you tell us a bit about it? All right. So it is a online digital uh, platform, a chess gaming platform. Ultimately, it is a grassroots uh, uh, organization that wants to educate its users on the benefits of chess. Um, for those living in remote communities, prisons, homeless shelters, senior populations, uh, marginalized communities in, gen in general, uh, I believe that a digital platform in many ways can level the uh, playing field. Uh, I mean, ultimately, if you live, for example, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, you often do not participate in the national championships. Uh, we now have the technology uh, that will allow uh, students in various locations to compete in the same tournament. 
Ultimately, I would like to make a deal with the United States Chess Federation to allow these students, even if they're in a remote uh, region, through a hybrid model, both online and over the board model, to participate in national championships. Now, of course, uh, of course, I love the idea. I mean, I'm all for the democratization of chess, Gerald, and it, it has long been a problem. Of course, you're from New York City, a historical chess hotbed, and I'm sure it benefited from that. But, you know, when we were kids, the U.S. was kind of a backwater, even though New York was a hotbed within that backwater. Now, of course, with uh, many immigrants to the U.S. and, of course, more importantly, the uh, uh, wider dissemination of information uh, on the Internet, and all the training tools, the U.S. is uh, one of the strongest chess countries in, in the world. But in any event, Gerald, of course, the, the elephant in the room when we talk about stuff like this is cheating. So how can we make chess like viable on a digital platform, but make sure that people aren't using computers to cheat? All right. So the first thing, the anti-cheating software has become a lot more e evolved. All, all the platforms, whether you're chess.com, whether you're Lee Chess, whether you are uh, ICC, they all have um, sophisticated anti-cheating software. Tr trust me, they know when you're using a computer. Uh, but just, a, just in terms of the hybrid model I, I mentioned early on, it is possible for us to have arbiters in those locations. So which means if there's a 20, if students from Alaska, Hawaii, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico wanted to participate in the national championships, I can cover them at a single uh, location, and then we can have arbiters at that location. So, um, so that's yet another way th that, that, we can, uh, that we can do it. But uh, I believe that the USCF is going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars or more, if not millions of dollars uh, more, if they accept this hybrid model. Uh, and, and we simply use arbiters at certain uh, locations. But yeah, I mean, we, we, we do have to be concerned about cheating. By the way, they did a study on cheating. I believe it was the... Um, ICC, uh, and they found out that the demographics of the age of cheating is mostly between nine and 12 years, years old. Would you believe that? Yeah, uh, I believe so, it. Yeah. So at that moment, I mean, that we can be hyper vigilant. Um, you should know that, re I mean, recently in, uh, they had a nationals for the, the, the great nationals. I believe ICC, both in, in chess kid participated in, in that nationals. Uh, so they use Zoom cameras at, the, at, at that time. Uh, so we're looking for different ways to uh, curtail the cheating, to monitor the cheating, whether it's Zoom cameras, whether it's arbiters, whether it's anti-cheating so uh, software. But we, 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 we're pretty confident that the technology sooner or later uh, will, will weed out the, uh, will, uh, the cheaters. Yeah, I mean, arbiters in particular, I mean, unless people are going to wage some kind of grand conspiracy, like involving many people, then I think it's effective. Now, um, and for the record, I, I'm an advocate of hybrid chess. Uh, FIDE uh, also is starting to incorporate it. And um, I understand that it, that it's not perfect and there are some kinks to be worked out. But I think, as Gerald alludes to, the greater good of the democratization of chess is um, is is worth the sacrifice. But I do have to ask, Gerald, as someone who's sort of come up in the, you know, in in New York and played uh, street games, I'm sure, with people blowing smoke in your face and played tournament games, you know, at fabled tournaments like the, at the Marshall and the New York Open, I'm sure, and stuff like that. Uh, what do you say to people who say it's not not the same experience as uh, sitting across from someone? Well, I, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of over the board chess, but let's be honest. I mean, there are people who are living in remote regions who do not have access for the game. And we now have the technology to bring a broader audience uh, in, into the game. So um, things change, models change. I mean, we, uh, this, is the, this is going to be the new model of chess. I think it's going to be great, not only for chess players, but even for tournament organizers, right? That can hold these multi-site, these hybrid events. Uh, any tournament organizer can move from 50 individuals to, uh, playing in, in this tournament to 500 individuals playing in, in, in their tournament. So it is market disruption. I mean, market disruption is just the way that uh, uh, that, that it goes. But uh, what you call the democratization of chess, um, A, is great for the organizers. B, is great for those living in, in remote uh, communities. And I think it's great both for FIDE and the United States Chess Federation as they're going to be more resourced through membership and tournament fees. Yeah. And as you say, it's not necessarily going to replace these things whole cloth. It's just like, as they say, with uh, with chess variants, you know, it's just good to have more offerings and good to have more possibilities and more people able to play. Now, 
So in addition to your organization, which sounds sounds great, and then we'll get the info for how to uh, support it or potentially help out or whatever it may be before before we let you go, Gerald. But I also want to hear about how sort of your teaching has evolved, because obviously, again, online age, everything's different. So how do you incorporate? Um, how do you? Uh, how have you changed your teaching um, as as time has gone on? And there are all of these online tools besides just the ability to play <laughs> each other. Yeah, I mean, teaching has been radicalized since I started in the 1990s. Um, when I was directing for Success Academy, uh, we used almost every tool. We, uh, we, we used uh, Chessable, we used Chess Kid, we used Lee Chess. Um, let's just, we can, I just can go one by one. Um, obviously, Chess Kid and Lee Chess kids can play thousands and thousands of games online. Game equals pattern recognition. Uh, game equals ta uh, problem solving, tactical execution. The more games you play, the, be the, more you, uh, uh, the better your skills get. Uh, so we don't have to wait for a one-on-one -on -one game anymore. Uh, a lot of the scholars can, can, can play online. So uh, I think I was telling you before, when I grew up, there were 200 grandmasters in the world. Now there's 1,700 grandmasters in the world. And that's mostly due to uh, the use of these technologies. But let me to give you some additional technologies, which I find fascinating. Uh, we integrated Google Classroom into uh, the um, elementary schools. It was already in our middle schools when I was uh, at Success Academy. Uh, Google Classroom allows the teacher to give a lesson to each individual inside of the classroom. In essence, we're micro-targeting each, each student. So, for example, student X needs help in Endgame, student Y needs help uh, in the opening, and let's say student B needs help in, in the middle game. The idea of a single lesson is uh, the teacher is no longer limited by a single a lesson because we have a Google Classroom. We can we can email each student um, uh, an individual lesson. So that's what we call asynchronous uh, classrooms. Uh, uh, and these asynchronous uh, classrooms will allow us to accelerate various skill sets um, and, and at the same time, yet. Um, uh, and by the way, they can email you back and you can give them assignments and so forth. Um, another, th another interesting tool that we use was a uh, Google forms and we, and we use, we, t most of our assessments and our tests. In fact, when I wrote the curriculum for success Academy, the assessments was, st uh, was stored on Google forms. The beautiful thing about Google forms is that the tests automatically grades themselves and the results of the tests are then put on Google sheets on a spreadsheet. So, which means you can track for the throughout the whole year. You can track your your scholars' uh, pro progress uh, through through Google Forms. Um, all of, all of these programs have self paced learning. They have videos. Um, they have puzzles. They have studies uh, that that you can solve. So, which means again, this is increasing pattern recognition. I work with uh, Mike Klein uh, and Chess Kid. Uh, in fact, one of the top performing schools. We had a, a, a school in Washington Heights. Uh, some of these second, third graders were doing 600 puzzles a month. Uh, and we can actually track the number of puzzles attempted as opposed to the number of, of puzzles solved. And that gap in between puzzles attempted and the puzzles solved was the area of growth uh, for the scholar. So pattern recognition, assessment tools, asynchronous classrooms, these are all revolutionary tools that I we did not have, let's say, uh, uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, when I was uh, teaching inside of uh, the Harlem schools. Amazing to hear. Yeah. And of course, uh, friends of the podcast at Chessable, they're launching their Chessable classroom, which I believe is still in beta. But basically the idea is it's sort of like a chess, a chest up version of the Google classroom. So I know that uh, as we record, uh, Grandmaster Vladimir Kramnik just did like a, um, just did a demo of it where he was going through some of the games from the, the World Cup. So yeah, just a brave new world, an amazing time to be a chess player. Um, so um, Gerald, you mentioned uh, that you work for Success Academy and um, we should explain for listeners just because they may, may not, people from outside of the New York area may not understand the magnitude of um, sort of a program like that or a job like that. So before we bring forward to recent developments, um, how many schools, like how many chess, could you just explain a bit about the chess <laughs> okay, program? So, so it, it's, it's massive. It's a mega program. For, so this academy breaks up into 47 schools, 30 elementary schools, 16 middle schools, and one high school. Chess is in every tier, elementary, middle school, high school. Um, as the director, when I got there, 
they had never won a national championship. Uh, Eva Makowitz was spending literally millions of dollars. She's a fan of the game. She was spending millions of dollars on chess, but uh, they had not won a national championship. Uh, did not really have a developed curriculum. By developed curriculum, I mean assessments, full, uh, fully developed assessment tools, a scope and sequence, uh, and scaffolded uh, uh, content. Um, part of the foundational work besides uh, curriculum and, uh, and moving their competitive metrics up, um, they did not have a broad outreach in terms of recruitment. Now, Success Academy pays a lot of money uh, if you bring a, if you refer a teacher um, uh, to the to the company. But the problem of recruiting in New York is, as you mentioned earlier on, New York is the mecca of chess, particularly is the mecca of scholastic chess. Uh, so to fill up all those schools, it, it would have been difficult to do it with referrals alone. Uh, we started using a USCF Blast for, as part of our recruitments. We, we went online and we accessed various databases. Uh, so this was all, all of the foundational work uh, that, that was needed to uh, transform the program uh, that I inherited in, in, in January of, 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 of 2019. In my um, 21 months and two weeks there, my very short stay, we had won four national championships. I was able to single-handedly uh, write the curriculum, uh, create their uh, K2 clubs. Uh, we did a lot of the, a lot of metric studies. Uh, interesting, one of the most interesting studies, believe it or not, in terms of our KPIs, our key performing indicators, uh, was the average number of games played at the elementary school level and the average number of games played at the middle school level. Uh, so, uh, and without going into the full uh, uh, details, about 360 games are played uh, on the elementary school level uh, at each school. Uh, rated games and about 720 games are played on the uh, on a middle school level. Uh, the Success Academy Middle School program is one of the most powerful uh, uh, programs. Um, the kids get about 10 hours of chess per week from someplace between 10 and 11 hours of chess per week. Um, if you qualify, you, you can go to five travel tournaments and uh, someplace between 12 and 15 uh, lo local tournaments. Um, so it's, it's just a, a powerhouse. And once I, uh, when I saw all of the, uh, the resources they were, they were putting in, into chess, eventually we were able to align those resources uh, that equals curriculum, that, equal, that, that equals a national recruitment. And, and, and as I mentioned to you, in my short stay there, they won four national championships. Yeah. And, uh, we should mention for listeners, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're a charter school, correct, Gerald? Yeah, they, they, they are a charter school, correct. And so that, of course, means that it's neither strictly public nor strictly private, but it, it receives a blend of um, uh, government money and privately raised money. Correct, which means uh, depending on the charter school, but most charter schools uh, in New York City may get something somewhere around fourteen thousand dollars per child, and the rest of the money comes in through uh, through private donors. So yeah, uh, and here, sorry, go ahead. You know, Success Academy is well resourced both in, on uh, on the donor end. And because they have uh, uh, so many students, um, they the annual budget is you know over over two hundred million dollars a year. Amazing, yeah. yeah. And uh, we should say charter schools here in the U.S. are a bit controversial. Some people think it kind of d dilutes the the student base of uh, of public schools and makes them less viable. Um, but in any event, the, the support for chess, I, I love to see. Obviously, uh, you had tons of chess teachers working under you, some of whom I know and have known. Um, and and more importantly, it's just great for the kids. I mean, we've talked many times on this podcast about the, uh, the, the benefits for kids and decision making and uh, thinking about consequences and, uh, you know, providing a social outlet and all that stuff. But Gerald, we also want to hear about why you've you've moved on from Success Academy. So, so what happened there? <laughs> um, so, so we're around June. I spoke up um, for the, an African American teacher. Let me just say something. Uh, Success was paying me a lot of money, and it wasn't necessarily that easy to uh, speak up. But it was right in the middle of the George Floyd protest, uh, June 2020. Uh, I had witnessed uh, several things. Uh, that uh, I could not remain silent on. Uh, number one, in my 21 months, again, in two weeks, they never held any tournaments in black and brown communities. Um, the tournaments were held at Cobble Hill in Southern Brooklyn, and they were held on the Upper West uh, Side. Um, 
the highest teaching position in Success Academy, meaning a teacher lead, is something called a lap site position. And that's why in 1920, there were three teachers of color that held that position. But in, in, in 2021, there were no teachers of color. They were all demoted uh, from that position. Uh, they were two in other- In 2020. Right? And two, and that's why 2021, a school year. Yeah, so, um, go ahead. Qualified African-Americans that were applying for uh, promotions in the chess program did not receive uh, any uh, promotions. Uh, so along with the issues of not holding tournaments in black and brown communities, the, the denial of uh, promotions, the uh, demotions of th three qualified um, uh, teachers who, 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 who had the highest position, the lap site teaching position in 1920, uh, at that moment, I figured, hey, I, I have to speak up. Um, they did not take kind to me speaking up. I will say that a series of actions, number one, I was reported to the HR department. I'm not sure exactly why I'm being reported to, to the HR department. Um, I was asked to speak to the second in command a, as a result of me writing an email and, and, and advocating for, uh, for a teacher, um, who was trans, uh, who was literally removed from his building. Uh, he had complained about racial discrimination uh, five months prior, and now he was being removed from his building. Um, the parent, not only I, but many of the parents, he was an incredibly uh, talented teacher. Uh, he had the second highest roster in Success Academy. Uh, his, and one year, his, his teams won the end of the year tournament, meaning all the teams in Success Academy gets together. His team won the end of the year tournament. Um, in SY, uh, uh, in school year 1920, he had the highest rated uh, player, uh, uh, Jessica Hyatt, uh, in the network. So to remove this teacher with this legacy from this building uh, was a tremendous blow to that uh, community. I voiced support for that teacher. Uh, and um, like I said, I had to go to, I was reported to the HR department and, and to the second in command. Um, Eventually, uh, somewhere around August uh, 2020, um, I was listed unknowingly. Let me say, say this again. I was listed unknowingly as a witness against the company. Uh, one of the teachers filed suit with the Human Rights Division slash EOC, and he listed the chess director as, as a witness. I really believe that sealed my, uh, my tenure at, uh, uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, company. So um, in October 2020, they tried to uh, demote me. I'm like, demotion? Are you kidding me? I mean, I wrote, huh. your, I wrote your curriculum. I delivered four national championships, uh, created your mandatory K2 clubs. Uh, first time, the first metrics that we did uh, uh, that were done, the KPIs, um, and created a national recruitment that hired over 20 teachers and brought in 100 resumes. If anything, forget the motion, I wrote uh, to Eva Makowitz that I deserve a bonus. Uh, but again, I didn't know that the full impact of me being listed as a witness against the company. So my advocacy, me being listed as, uh, as, as a witness against the company, eventually ended my tenure uh, in... Uh, January 20, uh, 2021, I filed a complaint with the Human Rights Division slash EOC uh, myself. Um, I'm still waiting for the verdict to see if, they, uh, if they're finding probable cause in my case. Man. Well, Gerald, I, I mean, I'm sorry to, to hear about that. I mean, it, it sounds obviously, I mean, you lived it, so you, you know what happened. But hearing you describe it, it sounds so so unequivocally wrong. Um, so if what defenses do they offer, just out of curiosity? <laughs> uh, without, uh, um, well, one of the, the issue of the tournaments, they, they offered an equal distance uh, argument. They felt that holding it in Cobble Hill and holding it in uh, up, Upper West was uh, because of ease of commute uh, for, for, for students coming in, in various locations. First thing, no one uses the equal distance argument for any tournament. Uh, we, I mean, we traveled to the national championships in Tennessee, upstate to right. Saratoga. Why are we using an equal distance argument for a location at, at, at a single tournament? Uh, but for me, inherently, uh, it is somewhat of a corporate uh, a gaslighting. When the scholars go to the... Um, to, to the middle schools for Success Academy. By the way, the way that charter schools work, it is a lottery system. So for you to get into a elementary school is by lottery. However, for you to get into a middle school is by parental and scholar choice. Um, and 
you can get to, uh, Success Academy is pretty liberal about any school you want to go to, meaning you could live in Bensonhurst and you can travel as far all the way downtown uh, to Hudson Yards. So if we are allowing a student to travel 200 days from Bensonhurst to Hudson Yards, why are we, why are we posing any equal distance argument for a, lo for a tournament location, right? So um, Success Academy is, has some, obviously some very positive things. You know, their brand is 91% of our scholars are passing uh, the reading test, 98% of our scholars are passing the math test. That is their brand. Uh, however, there's nothing wrong with holding tournaments in black and brown communities, and they will, uh, and they will serve themselves much better uh, by, um, by addressing this imbalance of power. Yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, it's important for the kids to have the things in their neighborhood. And as you say, in terms of the equal distance, New York kids are used to riding the subway too, and like, you know, all over the city. Now, what about the what do they say about the issue of um, not promoting teachers who were sounds like overqualified to be promoted? How do they defend themselves? What's their defense against that charge? Um. That's a little bit more complicated one. I mean, there were, as I mentioned, there there were two teachers. Um, one of the arguments was that the teacher didn't necessarily have a global view of the program. Now, the strange thing about this measurement of a global view of the program, it doesn't appear as part of the qualifications for the job. Right. So, if you're going to hold this, it should be something that's actually did the teacher perform now. Uh, metrics are very teacher performing and metrics are, are, are somewhat controversial, but but they're very important. I think most chess teachers we can we can look at the ratings of the kids, the, uh, how many kids he's he's rostering in a tournament, the relationships with parents, and the placements in city, state, and national championships. So really, these are the metrics, but but uh, in terms of teacher observations, um, I was looking to develop a more universal metric. Or this is simply a fairer metric. Uh, for teacher performance. But if, if, if we're going to say, well, a teacher doesn't have a global view of, of, of the program, and then you, uh, but it's not yet a part of your, your qualifications, that's an inconsistency. Um, so that was, in, in terms of the defense, that was one of the defenses that, uh, that, that was used, but it really doesn't hold water. Yeah. It, I'm not it sure sounds what like that it. means, a global view, a view of the program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, Gerald, I'm, I'm really, really sorry to to hear about it. I mean, it sounds like it was a, a you know, in, in a lot of respects, a great job. And obviously, again, the, 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 the influence that you had, the, the opportunity to help so many kids learn chess, it's hard to replicate. So I'm sure it's, um, it's been a trying time for you. Yeah, no, it was a, uh, a great experience. I mean, 47 schools is still 47 schools to oversee. Um, it, it really tests you in terms of your ability to recruit, to write curriculum, uh, your leadership skills in, in general, and the everyday decision making. Uh, I found it to be a tremendous uh, growth position, uh, but I could no longer be silent when I saw these uh, racial inequities. So, Gerald, I'm I'm really sorry that that you had to go through all that stuff. Obviously, we still have a long way to go with regard to race relations here in the U.S. Despite uh, any progress that's been made, do you, do you have anything else to add about your whole experience with Success Academy? Well, I guess one of the things that uh, that stood out, one of the more the more silly points, uh, was a background check. Now, I invited several speakers, uh, two white speakers, a Latino speaker, and an African American speaker, uh, but the African-American speaker was uh, put through an extreme background check. Let me just, right, so I'm not going to read the speaker uh, and mention here, uh, but this is our response to Success Academy's uh, position statement, a part of, the, this is in the rebuttal that, uh, that I wrote. In addition to being fingerprinted, the speaker was subject to a background check that would include criminal history, litigation history, motor vehicle record and accident history, social security number verification, address and alias history, credit history, verification of your education, employment and earnings history, certification checks, drug, alcohol testing results and history, military service and other information. See Exhibit B. Uh, this is Exhibit B is the email of the complaint. One of the Caucasian speakers were fingerprinted, which another was not and they were just required to submit the educational and employment history, but were not subject to the same invasive 
background check while responding claims that part of this extensive background check, including tax documents, may be a W-9 for a speaking fee, the speaker in question was not charging a fee. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, it's hard to it's hard to understand. I mean, and this is a, a the Success Academy is serving almost like predominantly minority students, correct, Joe? Close close to ninety percent, eighty three percent to be to be more precise. Yeah. And so, then just to have, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, th there was a clear a double standard in terms of the uh, background check. And unfortunately, uh, the speaker, were, by the way, he was coming there to organize a tournament. So he was both a speaker and a, and a tournament organizer. We, we had a match uh, with the SES Academy scholars uh, with, with South Africa, but he was not allowed on the premises. Uh, the speaker in, in, in question has a PhD in physics. Jeez. African American male PhD in physics. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's kind of a depressing <laughs> note to, to move forward on, Gerald. I mean, oh, all I can say is, uh, th again, there is a lot of good being done uh, by the organization, from what I can gather. So hopefully, they can find a way to treat their employees um, equitably across the board and continue to promote chess. But I'm sorry that you were kind of um, a, a casualty of. Uh, of what's gone on in the past. Um, but Gerald, I want to bring it forward because we have so much to, to talk about. So we're going to take a quick break and then I'd like to hear about your time in South Africa. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. And we are back. And Gerald, we have a, a question from Patreon supporter of the podcast and friend of the podcast, Stephen Sparks. Stephen actually, I believe, lives in South Africa and he's a historian. So he, he knows uh, of what he speaks. And here is Stephen's question. He says, uh, South Africa has a rich chess history. Like the U.S., chess in South Africa was strengthened by the introduction of immigrants from Eastern Europe and after World War II. In 1964, the national team played the Russian team, which included Petrosian, Botvinnik, Spassky, and Stein at the Tel Aviv Olympiad. But like the U.S., the history of racism in South Africa meant black players did not enjoy the same opportunity as the majority of white players. Although in 2015, South Africa celebrated its first ever grandmaster, GM Kenny Solomon, who's from a poor black township in Cape Town. So uh, Stephen's questions are, what did you learn about chess in South Africa during your time there? And how do you think the situation compares to the U.S. with regards to historically disadvantaged communities like Harlem? Well, first, let me answer the, the, the latter part of the question. The parallels between South Africa and the United States are uh, quite obvious in many ways. Number one, they were ruled by a minority. Here in the United States, African-Americans, we were ruled by a majority. Uh, they had a system called apartheid. Uh, we had a system called uh, Jim Crow. Uh, if you ask many of the South Africans, you know, what is the worst of the apartheid laws? Uh, they will tell you is the Lands Rem Removals Act. Uh, People were taken away from ancestral land and they were put inside of townships. So inside of the United States, um, we, we, were, we lived in ghettos and gulags and they were forced inside of the uh, uh, townships. Um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, when I was there my uh, three years, 2010, 2013 in South Africa, I saw an incredibly amount of talented players. Uh, Kenny Solomon, by the way, uh, when I was there, there was only one colored South African champion. Uh, by the way, the word color in South Africa is not a pejorative, it's part of national identity, it's not considered a pejorative term as it might be here in the uh, United States. Uh, and Watu uh, Kabesi uh, was also a uh, champion. Uh, I saw a lot of talented players uh, from uh, Nick Vandenot uh, to Henry Steele. Many of the white players were, were also uh, incredibly uh, talented. Uh, one advantage that the South Africans have that, that Blacks in the United States don't have is that many of uh, whether the coastal or the Zulu population are, are, are living there. You guys can play for the national team. 
it's very difficult for a black chess player here in the United States uh, to play for the national team and get that international uh, experience. Um, uh, I spoke to many of the organizers, particularly uh, Lyndon Boa, uh, Jerry Beeble. Jerry Beeble is American, by the way. Lyndon Boa is a uh, South African, but they fought uh, many of the of the rules. Uh, to uh, in fact, they um, uh, part of the divestment movement. Um, uh, was not to allow the South African players to play in, in, in the Chess Olympiad, which I believe was going on in the late 70s and in and, and the 1980s, uh, before Nelson Mandela created the first democratic uh, government. So in, uh, in many ways, uh, the political fight uh, in South Africa, the apartheid political fight, uh, wasn't just in, um, in one section of, of sports. It was even in, in chess as well. Um, and uh, fighters like Jerry, uh, Jerry Beeple and Lyndon Boer uh, uh, fought for, uh, not to allow South African players to, uh, to play in, 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 in the Olympiads. But um, I mean, I think the country has changed. Uh, I see uh, definitely, um, I see a lot of young, talented players uh, coming up. Uh, as I told you, when I was there, there was only one black South African champion and one colored champion, and all the other champions were white. I think that they've had a few more colored and, and, and black champions in, 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 in South Africa. Um, but just in terms of where we are in, in, in the United States, uh, Maurice Ashley at, at, uh, is the only um, uh, American um, uh, uh, black American uh, grandmaster, and, we, and we're hoping to, uh, to have some more, I, I believe, um, there's a his name escapes me. Uh, his name escapes me right now. But he's actually. From, I mean, why am I forgetting his name? He's he, he's from Harlem. I think he lives in, in Finland sometimes. Uh, but uh, I think Casa Corley. Uh, Casa Corley is Casa Corley is yeah. going to be our next. Uh, I, I think is going to be the next uh, homegrown uh, black a uh, 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 grandmaster. But yeah, so progress has been made, but it's still a long walk to um, uh, to you know some form of. Um, equity in terms of, of talent and developing of talent of, 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 of black and brown chess players, both here in the United States and, and in South Africa. Yeah. Shout out to Casa Corley. He's been on the podcast. Yeah. part, And I know he's, he's grinding hard. I think he just needs one more uh, GM norm. So uh, good, good luck to, to Casa. And Stephen actually also mentioned, of course, uh, Tani Adewumi, who when I interviewed Peter Svidler, of course, we discussed him briefly because uh, Peter's been doing these great this great series with Chess 24, where he gives lessons to Tani. And uh, Tani, of course, was also uh, notably featured in a couple columns by Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times and obviously has um, has made um, quite an impression and showing great strides. But obviously we need it. We need a. Uh, the movement to be bigger than that. So what else can can be done to sort of um, uh limit the um what you've called gerald the achievement gap within within chess well n number one an early start so players are strong for various reasons a an early start chess is a language uh the early uh, the, the, the more the earlier you're exposed to it the uh the, uh, the, the better um private lessons is a significant factor a lot of talented players in the inner cities do not have the resources uh, for, for private lessons um, just to show you the impact of, of private lessons, think that the student-teacher ratio, uh, student ratio actually decides the success of the students, meaning if there are 15 kids in, in one teacher as opposed to 30 kids in, in one teacher, that uh, the kids, the 1 to 15 ratio will be more successful. Uh, and so what, what a private lesson is, is not even a 1 to 15 ratio, is a 1 to 1 ratio, and, and, and they can correct many of your uh, uh, mistakes. In fact, the, the trainer does two things. Number one, he corrects your moves. And number two, he corrects your thinking. The latter is far more important. And I think the, the third point is the resources. You need exposure to top level competition. Um, so if they get an early start, exposure to top competition, uh, access to private training, I think in many ways we can close the achievement gap. Yeah. And of course, um, Elizabeth Spiegel and the IS-318, they've turned out some great players. We should give like James Black and Justice Williams and uh, Joshua Collis, um, all these strong African-American players coming up. Um, but and, you know, I mean, they're in their 20s now. So I guess I don't know if coming up is the right term. But anyway, obviously, they've achieved a lot. But and of course, Gerald, your organization can help as well, because it's not just from places that are far away, as you mentioned, like Alaska, but uh, maybe teams who can't afford to go to 
send 20 kids on a plane to go uh, to a national championship can then compete um, at a proctored site. Right. So we're actually a social corporation, uh, which means that 10 percent of our money we uh, uh, we're going to give back. We're not going to be listed as a as a nonprofit. Uh, so social corporation, that 10 percent is exactly what you're talking about uh, for talented players. We can uh, we can give them lessons, the travel fees that's so expensive uh, for tournaments. Um, but uh, when I lived in South Africa, the southern hemisphere, the many of the players, uh, the biggest barrier was the travel fees. Uh, the now through a digital platform, we can send an arbiter to South Africa. One arbiter can go to uh, South Africa, and they can play international uh, tournaments. So this is one of the things that we're, we're beginning to, to think about. So yes, resources, surplus resources, can be given to up and coming talent, uh, but we can also host uh, these tournaments in remote uh, locations if um, uh, transportation fees. Uh, become a barrier. Yeah, glad to hear it. So, so what's what's going on? I know Gerald. Uh, we've talked a bit about sort of the process of launching it. So, what's what's the status of the organization right now? <laughs> what kind of nonsense are you dealing with on a day to day basis? All right. So the business plans. So business plans of these days, um, Ben, are not the general 25 pages that you read on a Word document or a Google Sheets document, uh, they're pitch decks. So basically, they're PowerPoint presentations uh, that you put together. You pitch for 15 to 20 minutes to your future investors uh, to see if, if, if they're going to buy it. Um, you know, our base, we're asking for at least $300,000, but we really think that we need a million dollars to uh, launch uh, the app. It will be both a mobile and uh, desktop as well as your phone. Um, and, we, and, and we're going to have the, the traditional features that all the apps have, online gaming, uh, videos and puzzles, et cetera. Uh, but we want to bring some additional features, something as simple as uh, if you're living in a remote commu community and you want to play, uh, organize an over-the-board tournament, uh, whether it's a Swiss uh, TD or some other uh, version of tournament software, our server will allow you to organize over-the-board tournaments, not just online tournaments, but over-the-board tournaments. Uh, uh, the biggest factor for the for marginalized communities or poor communities is what I call the self-sustaining model, and we and we have to look at it what I call the trifecta model. And by the trifecta model, meaning that we're not just uh, creating chess players, we're also creating chess teachers, and we're also creating chess organ uh, organizers, which are arbiters and tournament directors. So a community becomes self-sustaining if they have if they have those three. One players, two teachers, three organizers. So we're going to put a lot of resources in developing teachers and organizers in various locations. That's great to hear. So I'm guessing at this stage, uh, a lot of your work probably is centered around the sort of fundraising? Uh, correct. Uh, fun fundraising. Um, uh, right now, we don't have a, a GoFundMe page just yet. Uh, the business plan is 92, 94% uh, finished. Um, and we, like I said, anyone interested uh, for the pitch, we will we'll, uh, uh, we can pitch it to you. Like I said, it's, it's done now through these uh, pitch decks. Um, and we can also send you some uh, 10, 15 pages of just our, our blueprint of, of what we want to do going, go, going, going forward. Um, but we're looking for a broad population, like as I mentioned, senior population, homeless shelters, prisons, uh, a lot of underserved communities that has that has an interest in, in, in chess, but simply are not marketed to. And so where that that gap in between that maybe a chess.com or a lead chess or a ICC doesn't reach out to, I'm going to try to get the, uh, th those numbers in between. Great. Yeah. Prisons. Is, I mean, prisons are one that I really feel like uh, it's just it's such a great act. I mean, it's such a good activity for people who don't have a lot of options to um, to engage in. So hopefully it's successful in that and other regards. And obviously we'll put we'll put uh, any information for supporting Gerald's endeavors in the, in the show notes. So we'll, whenever the GoFundMe is ready, Gerald, I'll kick in a small donation. And of course, we'll um We'll uh we'll put it in the show notes uh after the fact if you just uh let me know. So Gerald, um one last topic before um before we wrap this up. Um I couldn't help but notice I think it was on your Facebook page you had a picture of yourself with uh, Kasparov. <laughs> oh yeah, so this is a while back. This is when I was directing for the Holland Children's Zone, 
There were three chess festivals in, ha in Harlem. I was part of all three chess festivals. Uh, but the last one, we invited Gary Kasparov. The very first one uh, was the celebration of Maurice Ashley becoming the first uh, Black Grandmaster. The second one was, some, on a certain level, a continuation of, of that. And the third one, uh, we invited Kasparov to play the most talented uh, scholars in New York City. I believe this is somewhere around 2008, 2000, probably around 2008, we, we held the uh, festival. Uh, by the way, I got a chance to play Kasparov in a single game. Let me tell you, I was oh, wow. impressed. Uh, uh, with I had black. Uh, he played D4. I played the orthodox defense against him. Yes, he won the game, but uh, I was impressed with his energy. I could not believe how much energy Kasparov puts in a single a game, how much energy he puts in a single move. Uh, but um, yeah, Kasparov had a chance to play many of the scholars. In fact, uh, uh, Rochelle Balatine, uh, who was one of the uh, great chess players, she had, by the way, she also won uh, the all girls tournament, the under 16 all, all girls tournament. Uh, she's from that great team of, of, of 318. Uh, but she get, she was the last one standing and she gave him the most uh, difficult game uh, when I asked him to, uh, towards the end. But he was incredibly gracious. Um, and yeah, yeah, that was our uh, uh, my moment with Kasparov. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And Rochelle, of course, has been on the show as well, doing doing amazing things. Um, so and of course, obviously not quite on the level of Kasparov, but getting pretty close. Uh, Maurice Ashley, um, obviously, as a fellow New Yorker, I'm sure you've had uh, um, you, you know, Maurice. Well, um, have you guys ever played any blitz games, Gerald? <laughs> oh, yeah, I played Maurice uh, Blitz uh, for, uh, very quickly. Uh, for, I mean, for the general audience, Maurice Ashley became the first uh, African-American grandmaster in 1999. Uh, the Grandmaster title began in 1950, so it took 49 years to, to produce the first African-American uh, Grandmaster. I watched Maurice's evolution from a player uh, to a teacher, to a coach, to a director, uh, <laughs> to a commentator, uh, and to a um, tournament organizer. As you know, he had the million, million, Millionaire Chess uh, Tournament. Uh, so now he's a mogul. More recent, generally, is, is, yeah, a, is a chess uh, a, a, a mogul. Uh, but yeah, he was passionate. I mean, we we knew at that time. Anyone, this was um, early uh, mid mid nineteen nineties. Everybody knew that Maurice was going to be the uh, first uh, uh, black grandmaster. He had the discipline. He had the focus skills. He had the passion uh, for it. His, his journey was quite impressive. Yeah, and he did a great interview. I've mentioned the Tim Ferriss one before, but I should give a shout out to a friend of the pod, John Hartman, um, who interviewed Maurice uh, for Cover Stories with Chess Life late last year, where where John asked a bunch of good questions and Maurice really walked through his his whole evolution as a chess player. And of course, uh, in recent news, um, Maurice is going to be doing a spot for NBC Sports on the uh, the Chess World Championship. So obviously, major coup for Maurice himself. And it's great to see that he'll be shining a light on... Uh, our biggest event that we're all uh, looking forward to. Um, so, Gerald, any other stories to tell or information to dispense before we wrap this up? No, I, first thing, my journey has been incredible. I mean, I've worked, uh, I directed for the Mott Hall School, for Harlem Children's Zone, for Success Academy. I mean, I've literally worked for uh, two different uh, uh, billionaires, uh, Stanley Drunken Miller and Daniel Rose. Uh, many ways, if, if I were to write a, uh, biography, autobiography, it would be called The Best Seat in the House. I got a chance to, to play world champion Gary Kasparov. I saw the first African-American um, uh, uh, become a grandmaster. I worked with Maurice for four years, 1995 to 1999. Uh, so it's been quite a run. And really my evolution now is from, from moving from teacher to co from, from coach, uh, teacher, coach, director, and now uh, organizer of a digital platform. Yeah, and as you mentioned in our uh, lost tape, um, the, you're, you can you consider this your sort of life's work. Like this is what you want to work on for the foreseeable future, hopefully decades. Or, yeah, I mean, right? as, as I told you before, the evolution of chess and through digital technology has transformed the game. There's a reason why we have this leap from 200 grandmasters to 1700 grandmasters. I think last time we spoke, I gave you the comparison to uh, uh, Carlson uh, to Fisher, uh, the idea that um, 
uh, we can now play thousands and thousands of games a year. I average about three, four thousand games a year on, on the internet. This was not, this was never done before, uh, before the late 1990s and early 2000s. So the pattern recognition of a chess player is almost 10 to one to previous generations. Um, we could refute a towel combination before it took, a, took us six months to refute a, a towel combination. We can now do it in the click of a mouse. Uh, Fisher had to turn page by page. Uh, we can simply go to a database and we can see hundreds and hundreds and thousands of games, again, in pre increasing our, our pattern recognition. Uh, because of table bases, uh, we can ask for rook and bishop endgames. In fact, the, the computer doesn't say, um, if we ask the computer for a rook and bishop endgame, it says, do you want the same color bishop or the opposite color bishops? Right. <laughs> uh, and so the specificity is radically changed chess. Uh, that's why we have so many uh, grandmasters uh, today, uh, and hopefully this technology can be used uh, to help um, all communities. Yes, agreed. So Gerald, yeah, we look we look forward to the the project. Um, look forward to seeing how it unfolds. Yeah, and the the continued growth of chess. Um, so so thank you for uh, thank you for doing this interview not once but twice, Gerald. Much appreciated. <laughs> And thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, I'll let you know how it goes once the uh, GoFundMe page is up, and I'll, I'll be able to give you further insight. But right now, you can email me at jtimes at gmail.com uh, if you would like to bring resources or be an investor uh, for Chess AB, otherwise known as Chess Across Borders. Excellent. Yeah. And are you looking for sort of people to help out? I mean, obviously, I, I encourage people to donate um, and I will be doing so myself. But do, are you looking for like, I don't know if you're at the employee stage or the volunteer stage, but eventually we're going to need code writers, journalists uh, I mean, for our program. Um, I like kind of what chess.com does. They have about 200 people working for them, but they don't really have a, a single location. Uh, so through through. Um, as, as we go forward, yes, code writers, uh, eventually we're going to need a CTO, chief, a chief technical uh, officer uh, for the project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the future vision of it. But right now we need the resources so we can pay those uh, future employees. Excellent. OK, well, Gerald, uh, thanks. Thanks for telling us about it. Yeah. And we, we look forward to, uh, to watching the story unfold. Thanks so much, Ben. Hello, everyone. We are back about one week after our original interview. As I mentioned at the top of the show, um, these conversations are always fun and free flowing, but occasionally we want to clarify a few things, make sure we give people credit where it's due and things of that nature. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it back to Gerald to uh, clarify a few things. How's it going, Gerald? Uh, pretty good, uh, Ben. Uh, first, let me just talk about uh, South Africa in terms of the whole process there. Uh, their chess actually goes through three stages. The first stage is the apartheid stage. Uh, the mantra there was that there should be no sport uh, during the apartheid state. A major figure was an American international arbiter by the name of Jerry Beeble. He, pu he pushed for the boycott of South Africa and the chess Olympiads during the apartheid era. After the apartheid era, the second state is the unification era, uh, and that meant that white, colored, and black players competed on the same team. A major figure there would have been a Lyndon uh, Boa. And finally, the third stage, which is the post-apartheid era, uh, the country is moving towards competitive excellence, and they are looking to produce grandmasters. The key figure here is Kenny Solomon, as he became South Africa's uh, first uh, grandmaster. Now, we mentioned we were talking about candidate moves and move selection in, in uh, the famous book, Think Like a Grandmaster. I would say uh, I really wanted to expound a little bit more on that uh, point uh, because our move selection uh, these days may come from many reasons. Uh, for example, a move may come out of a lightning bolt from the gut, thus, mm -hmm. the, move, thus the move is made out of creativity and intuition. Uh, move may be played because you think it's difficult for the opponent to handle. Thus, the move is based on the uh, psychology of the battle. Also, a move is played simply because uh, there is no other move in the position. Uh, these moves are not chosen out of the tree of analysis or, or, or the candidate process. Uh, th these are moves that are just relative to the state of the battle. Uh, Kodov was teaching us how to think at that particular time. However, Martin Chess is not so much about thinking as it is about rethinking. 
Uh, we no longer have a single strategy that follows us through the game. In fact, we are constantly reassessing the position. We have a creative approach, uh, a more creative approach to problem solving and more than chess. Um, with Success Academy in regards to promotion, uh, there were no teachers, as I mentioned, uh, in the year, in the school year 2021, uh, teachers of color, I should mention, that were given the lab site position. However, we do have a second uh, lead position. Uh, we were able to give those teachers, uh, which, by the way, the second lead position is called the content lead. Uh, and so teachers of, of color did receive the uh, second lead position. Uh, in regards to the national titles, uh, I was speaking mostly about national titles that were organized by the United States Chess Federation. Uh, Success Academy did have a uh, national title under the uh, Girls Championship in 2018. So within a uh, two-year span, less than a two-year span, span, Success Academy won six national uh, titles, uh, four directly under me, and, this, and two more af after I left. So I just wanted to be more specific ab ab about those details. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for, for clearing that up, Gerald. I know that personally, if I did, if I like tried to clarify everything, it would be an endless loop because I have a <laughs> tendency, um, you know, it's, it's hard when you're speaking uh, extemporaneously to, um, to remember everything that you wanted to say. And at least that's been my experience. So thanks for hopping back on, Gerald. And uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible, most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy. I also would like to thank everyone who helped spread the word about the show. Did you guys know that there's still people who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast? There's even chess players who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast. So we need to fix that. And the ways to do that include writing positive reviews on podcast platforms or YouTube comments telling friends, all that stuff makes a difference in helping spread the word about the show. But of course, I most of all want to thank people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So without further ado, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Heath, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Farhan Thawar, Barasawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsythe, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, The King's Crusher YouTube channel, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Grandmaster Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flummins, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gerson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue. Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio K. Leonfort, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard, Lynn, Brian, Chase, Brian, Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Pats of Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Tennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Padilla, 
Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Francis Letart Lavoir, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Bihan, Jacob Kovach, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastio, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Takumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe Dasano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kravutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanovas, aka Photo Chess, Mark Shaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Cassie Passanen, Paul Blain, Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited of Switzerland, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel and Publishing Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tata Abrahamian, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks to you all for the support, and we will catch you all next week.